Hey everybody, it's Talk Gnosis, and uh, this is uh, part two of two, talking to Michael R. Osborne about his awesome book, The Brazen Serpent, Chaos and Order. Uh, I highly recommend that perhaps you check out the first part. It is uh, a wonderfully dense book full of all sorts of connections, uh, mythology, symbols, art going for uh, all of human history. But but you know, Michael, uh, and of course, you know, you don't have to watch the first part yet. Just, just watch this part. But uh, you know, Michael, I, I I realized last time we spoke, when I, when I was talking about the book and, and talking about all this, this awesome knowledge that's in it, fr from the description and from perhaps some people watching uh, with the two parts, they're like, wow, this book must be like 5,000 pages. It must be, the, it must be a, an a, a set of encyclopedias. But it's, it's, it's a wonderful, what, like a 180-some pages. And it's, it's also a fun read, right? It, it moves at, at a good pace. And uh, somebody once told me that that human beings we get a, a dopamine hit uh, we by making connections. There's something about humans that like making connections. So I, I think if people read this book, you're you're going to get a, a brain full of dopamine. Um, so Michael, if we can uh, just launch right into it, and uh, a question I, I I'm really curious about that that I think perhaps a lot of people who who watched the first part might also be curious about, which is how can a symbol represent two opposing forces. Like, how can something represent one thing? Like, uh, like I can understand how a symbol can represent like more than one thing, right? But I, I, how can a symbol represent one thing in its exact opposite? Can, can you help me out with that? That's uh, a, a huge question, but I mean, of course, um, in, in physics, that's exactly what happens, isn't it? Um, and in electricity, you have the positive and negative, and you have male and female, light and dark, um, and the list goes on and on. And this polarity um, is, they are competing energies, and they happen on the spiritual sphere as much as they do on the physical sphere. And if I understand you, your question correctly, it's almost about how does this almost, if you like, hypostatic union between spirit and matter come about? How, how can it be contained within or locked within matter? Or indeed, how can matter possibly exist in some way, shape or form with spirit? Well, you know, great Christian mysteries, aren't they? The incarnation and the, um, the ascension um, are essentially about this and how um, God can incarnate both as fully man and as fully God and and how the human part of Christ could could be um, assumed if you like in, in into the Godhead at the ascension the mysteries I mean the church has always said the mysteries I don't suppose anyone's got a, um, a, a definitive answer we, we can't do it because it's beyond our science isn't it um, but I'm sure that, that eventually it would be but Here's the thing about the brazen serpent, because, of course, I'm using that as an example of these contrasting things locked into this into this symbol, which is what it was. It is essentially talismanic energy. Right. Energy, healing energy. The Nehushtan is a um, is a, is a symbol of, of healing between humanity and divinity, God. Uh, the people are afflicted. So it's a symbol, it's an allegory, really, of that relationship or that healing trapped in the material realm of suffering, death, physical decay. Yet we have this mind, don't we, which is made up of synapses of electricity and billions of, of uh, what do they call them, quarks, isn't it, and things like that, um, which isn't physical in our very selves and we're conscious beings we're rational beings and we know we're growing old and we know we're dying and we we we, we feel grief and hurt and and need and things like this so we're in this horrible situation in in many ways looking at it negatively of course there's a positive to it which is that you know life can also be embraced and enjoyed but one way or the other as the buddha said it's coming to an end so it's all suffering ultimately yeah. and um god therefore who is immutable um, is suggesting through this image, this allegory, that there is hope. I mean, in, in some ways, the Nehushtan is a little like Pandora's box. It's an image of hope. 
as a spirit of hope. Um, so you have the talismanic energy. People look at this and they're healed. Um, now, um, the, the, the important thing is that you have within the Nehushtan, not within this um, symbol, you have the, the four elements contained within it. You have wood, you have fire and water. And of course, as it's raised up, you, it's also raised into the into the air. And if you recall from the last time when we talked about um, the, the presence of God innate within Moses' wand or state or staff and Aaron's staff as well, for that matter, um, spirit somehow is contained within it too. So you actually have five elements, if you like, contained within this one image now one part of that is spirit and the other four fifths of course are material substances the wood earth and then you have the the the, the fire uh, and the um uh, the, the, the the water um that's involved in the creation of of the, of the bronze and the processes of that and the air and water of course as it's raised up um for people to look upon and in order to be healed it needs to contain that spirit energy as well now it's a bit of a mystery but that's essentially what the Nehushtan is it's an alchemical symbol okay and most religious symbol symbols are I mean this is just how it is I mean it can't be any um, coincidence that Christ says he says it at John um, chapter 3 verse 8 um, the wind bloweth where it listeth, he says, um, and thou hearest the sound, but ye can't tell where it cometh and whither it goeth. And so everyone, so is everyone that is born of the spirit. So he's saying there that, you know, you may be physical beings, but you're also spiritual beings as well. So it's that kind of dichotomy. And this is why Nicodemus says to him, well, it's how can a man be born again? I don't understand. You pop out once and that's it. it can't, you can't be born again twice, yeah. but you can in spirit, you see, and you can be cured um, in, 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 in spirit in this life and, and the one beyond. So this is why the Nehushtan, um, in some respects, is the perfect symbol for the Messiah as well. And I think that's essentially what this was in the courtyard of the temple. It was a messianic symbol, okay, of what's coming. And one of the reasons Hezekiah may have pulled it down was it was some sort of challenge, perhaps, to his to his um, authority and kingship. The future Messiah, the future king, is somehow represented already in the in the temple forecourt and a reminder i think that temporal kingship and temporal power is transitory and passing and that something's coming so when jesus says you know i will be raised up um, on a tree just like the nehushtan this is exactly what he's saying and he's also alluding to the fact that he is comprised of physical elements and the body mortal like everybody else but he also has the power and spirit of god dwelling within him so I'm, I'm a big fan of dialectical monism. Uh, that is, and this is from Wikipedia, uh, dialectical monism, also known as dualistic monism or monistic dualism, is an ontological position that holds that reality is ultimately a unified whole, distinguishing itself from monism by asserting that this whole necessarily expresses itself in dualistic terms. Do you... Do you... Do you, do you jive with this with this perspective? Do you see a, a, a perspective like this kind of hidden in the brazen serpent symbol? Well, unpick that for me. Hmm? Oh yes, unpick so, that for me. Yeah, well, sort of like the uh, like like the Tao, or um, uh, I would even say the the ancient Gnostics, who are who are sometimes labeled as as dualists. But when you really read some of the some of the Nag Hammadi texts very carefully. It's the, there isn't a clear split between the higher and the lower, right? Everything emanates from the one, and the one is still there on some level. So reality seems, at least by our perspectives, to, to constantly be flowing, creating itself, interacting with itself through opposites, through, uh, 
through what seems to be opposing forces. But actually, they're, they're two sides of the same coin. So it's, it's, there's not a dualism that, that's a clear split. You know, there isn't light and dark. There's light-dark, all one word. But from our perspective, it often seems like they're, they're dueling opposites, but it's actually just the flow of reality. Yeah, so, I, I get that. So it's kind of like the force in Star Wars, really. Yeah. Um, so you've got that whole the, the, the Taoist thing. Well, I mean, I, I write and come from a Judeo-Christian tradition. Yeah. So one thing I've been um, reading around quite recently is the whole Martinist concept of the ineffable creator who emanates um, a being. This is Lucifer to um to exercise free will and to enjoy himself and and what he's all about now lucifer almost immediately um um rebels against god yeah. and believes he's exactly the same as god and just as powerful and he, you know god's not original and he's not um a creator any more than he can be false he has to be booted out of heaven and then of course um God creates man to bring Lucifer back, man falls as well. And then Christ is the one that actually does the job that the other two are supposed to do. So man falling into matter, as it were, a spiritual being, a, a sort of super angel that's splintered into eight billion fragments as of today, um, falls into matter, um, evolution evolutionary effects take place we we evolve to the position we are now um, in order to perceive the world as being a, a mixed place of good and evil yeah. a mixed place of good and evil so it's dualistic in one sense and yet ultimately it comes to an end because time is created too and beyond all of that is this immutable creator this oneness and of course the, the 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 evil that's latent within lucifer or the good within christ that's sort of imminent in some way or some sense it's never expressed it can't be because god is good but it's imminent and latent within the divinity somewhere in one way shape or form because it couldn't have happened otherwise yeah right yeah exactly it, it has to be latent in there or it, it wouldn't have happened <laughs> so um i i think people watching who who aren't familiar and we have talked about martyrdom on the show uh, before and i have a feeling you and i are going to be talking about it again in a future episode um and and, and some of the martyrdom myth but, but i think there's something so beautiful and powerful that that we were originally created to save lucifer and you know it's uh if, if god has a plan and you know this this plan has gotten a little bit off track of us falling into matter but his plan will ultimately win out, which means that we'll be redeemed and, and perhaps uh, uh, these these currently evil forces will be redeemed. Uh, something else I find yeah. really powerful in, in the modernist myth is they, they talk about these prevocating spirits, which again, were sort of originally emanated um, as, as good positive spirits. And in some interpretations of the modernist myth, the reason that they fall and become evil spirits is because they don't want to reintegrate with God. They want to stay separate. And that's that's their sin, the sin of separation, the sin of ego, the sin of being alone, the sin of I'm going to go my own way without others, without a community, without coming back into the wholeness that is God. Because the wholeness that is God is is contains everything. So you're it, they're still in there, but they, they they want to be separate. And I think there's also an important psychological metaphor there, but also perhaps a metaphor about how we should be living our lives. Because uh, yeah. I think because yeah. we, we need to be together. We need to be united. We can't yeah. be completely divided. Um, yeah, absolutely. Because the divine immensity, if you like, is a model of the perfect society. Yeah. Where, where nobody harms one another. Yeah. There's no theft. Um, there's no competition. And, and there's just love and mutual respect. But, of course, these conditions are impossible here on Earth. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but you're right. Everything you've just said is absolutely bang on. And, and I wonder too, and again, it's, it's sort of inherent within within bo both the classical uh, sort of ideas about the fall as well as the sort of more mystical, elaborate, here's the rest of the story uh, uh, versions that you find in modernism and some of the other esoteric traditions. You know, it, it's not it's not always said, but 
like, you know, Michael, I, I talk about this a lot in the show. I struggle on it because I haven't found the language for it yet. But I, I don't think that that the divine wants us to suffer. I, I don't think that we're here to to suffer, to become better. Uh, it, it, but, I, but there's got to be, you know, he, uh, and again, you know, when I say he, when I say the divine, again, the, these are metaphors. This is realities that, that can't be put in the word. So, you know, I'm just going to say God, he, she, it, whatever. It's, it's, it's part of the process. It's necessary somehow. Even though it is a fall, it, it, it has to be in some mysterious way, if not part of the will, but part of the plan, part of the outpouring of God, part of what will eventually be the, the full divine reality. But I haven't been able to, I don't know if you agree with that, and I know I'm not making much sense, but I haven't been able to, to articulate this. Because some people will kind of articulate it and say, well, you know, it's part of the plan, but actually human beings are supposed to suffer to get better, get back to God, or it's all a test. And and the language that I'm saying does sound similar to that, but it's it's not it's 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 not quite what I mean. But it, maybe I'll never find the words because these are things. That's why we're talking about symbols. Uh, these are things that can't always be put into words. So I don't know what what you think about that rant. Well, I think it's an interesting one because it, it it comes down to um the 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 origin of evil really and who's responsible and all the rest of it um <clears throat> it's not part of god's plan that people suffer not i mean i i, I don't know I, I i couldn't i don't i'd struggle with that i think on, on a personal level i think something went wrong yeah um against god's will is the way i would look at it so you have the rebellion it's caused by pride and hubris and and ignorance or whatever it is but there is this this fall out of um, uh, perfection or celestial bliss into the material world and of course time is created is it not to put a a limit on its existence to put a limit on the suffering's existence so we are suffering we do suffer we do terrible things to one another there are wars there are there's violence and and there's poverty and there's the rich and the poor and all sorts all manner of injustices in this world for which we must take responsibility and it's a path of return now that wasn't the will of god that we were in this situation but it's a path of return and in order to actually get back to where we need to to go we need to evolve to a certain state where we can begin to to um reintegrate with god it's a process of evolution and evolution is suffering yeah. each previous generation has suffered more and and this is the thing you see so yes suffering is absolutely essential um for us in order to um evolve back to where we should be okay um i mean yeah it's, it's just a, it's a very interesting interesting thought but it's not part of a it wasn't originally the plan i guess it's plan b <laughs> yes yeah. that's, that's why i would look at it yeah, well, it, uh, you know, the, the, again, with uh, and I know you've written kind of uh, people do compare the Martinist myth with some of the Gnostic myths, and, and I do see some similarities. But I, I know you wrote a piece, uh, you know, really pointing out some of the strong differences, which is, uh, Michael, you you mentioned alchemy in in our conversation just just a few minutes ago, and uh, there's a lot of alchemy in your book. Now, maybe people who aren't aren't that familiar with the esoteric tradition they, they they think of alchemy well that's that's a bunch of quacks trying to turn lead into gold and they're picking up your book they're seeing all these these references to to alchemy so, uh, what why is there so much alchemy in the book and, and how can it help us understand the serpent cipher well i mean it's a word john it's it's a word i mean essentially everything is alchemy because we live in a chemical organic biological universe don't we yeah and it's tied to time so everything is comprised of something or 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 another it's it's a it's a system isn't it it's a it's a biosphere if you like of life here on the planet and if we just look at our own planet um things like our atmosphere are kept into place by the um the the magnetism from the core of the earth and it's all it's all connected in 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 one way or another now alchemy is essentially saying that the, the this material 
or the material of the of your individual mind actually because it's about your spiritual uh, progress and mind yeah there are um, practical alchemists but that's not what i'm writing about i'm writing about um spiritual alchemy and they're saying that you can transform this material um through the process of suffering and learning from your mistakes and learning to to rediscover who you are and what you once were and what you can become again in the future so it's like a sort of almost like a going back to how we were rather than going forward but of course we're evolving physically so somewhere they meet that back and alchemy is essentially that it's saying that it's a process of transformation just as someone can transform um, base metals into gold and oh, well that's what they attempt to do you know i mean that that's the idea that's the ultimate thing is to is to to become the gold the valuable essence if you like the valuable material by transforming these baser less valuable ones um and and that's the purpose of of alchemy um it's a word uh, if you can think of a better one um i'd use that no, I I think that's perfect. I think that's perfect. Yeah. Now, another another term that uh that you know people have heard of alchemy, but maybe they have misconceptions about it. But maybe a term that that a lot of people haven't heard. And uh, correct me if I'm saying it incorrectly, but what dunamis? Uh, d uh, oh, yeah, yeah. What 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 is it? And 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 how do we access it? Yeah. Okay. Well, the the idea behind that is that that spirit actually um, is a is a substance. It's something that can actually um, be experienced in the physical realm okay as people may see ghosts they may see angels they may experience miracles um things of that nature but the idea behind dunamis which obviously means um shock or an energy essentially explosive the word, our word dynamite comes from the greek word dunamis is this explosive force of, of spiritual power that enables the apostles, say Paul, for instance, to 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 raise the dead back to life? OK, to perform necromancy through a miracle, through this power, this dunamis. Now, if that's there, it has to exist latent within whoever's operating it. And Paul is operating that power, or at least he's the conduit for it. Through his will, he's doing God's work and bringing the dead back to life. So in, in the Brazen Serpent, I'm talking about um, what happened to poor old Eutychius, the child that fell to his death when he fell asleep in the window, teenager. Well, he died. And Paul, of course, prostrates himself, falls upon him and says, you know, rise, be whole. And, and this, this young man um, is indeed brought back to life. It's not Paul's power. It was a it was a an explosive sort of power and um it manifested itself in such a way for the purpose of making people believe in paul in order that they can believe in his message and interpretation of god so it serves a purpose which is why it isn't happening in every ambulance around the world every day it's got to be for a purpose to bring people on board in that particular point so it's like a strategic thing really a strategic use of spiritual force or power um i mean there are various people that have written about this they, they've talked about curly and energy fields uh, and whatever it is or whatever the consciousness is um latent within us actually as as, as beings um, what might spirit actually be does it exist is it is it quantifiable material science will tell you no but there are some material scientists that um, are, are talking more about the possibility of its existence okay the the, the, the spirit soul if you like um i mean one of them is konstantin karokov i mentioned him in the book he um um, conducted an experiment on um, on deceased bodies in a Moscow hospital with a team of scientists over a period of months. They ranged in 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 their, in their sex, age, and method of death. 
natural suicide accidents and things like that and they, they monitored the bodies and they they, they noted the energy um, exchanges and they, they come up with some very interesting results now you've got to buy Karotkov's book properly to get deep into that because I can't spend more than a page or two in mine on it so the idea is I'm flagging that up but there's also um, people like Sam Parnia in England who um, is talking about the survival of 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 the the intellect perhaps the survival of the intellect beyond death as well now if it's true it's nothing to do with the physical is it it's something that exists outside that and spirit or, or power so if you've got that in individual people how much more so would the power or or, or spirit be of of a divinity yeah. okay and this is dunamis this is what's coming through the apostles okay to 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 heal and to raise the dead specifically that sort of power yeah. so so obviously the gospel of john comes up quite a lot in your book right that that has the the uh the brazen serpent uh uh, uh teaching from jesus of him comparing yeah, himself john. to the serpent yeah. yeah john is the empire strikes back of of, of all <laughs> gospels yeah yeah okay. no it's I, I get something you know how many how many times have i read it in my life thousands <laughs> of times every time i read it I, I i get something new and your book let me see something new in it and that's going to be the rest of my life it's uh uh but yeah it, it truly it truly is but uh and again you know every question i ask you like could be an hour show in and of itself <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> It's the so, problem. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I also want to again tell people, hey, the book, the book is you, you can sit down and read it in a, in a couple sessions. It's dense, but it's very readable. Um, but can you give us some examples of how other ways the Gospel of John comes up? Like I, you mentioned the Nicodemus narrative, but something I never saw before that I found quite fascinating was was what it has to do with alchemy. And maybe if you could also tell us about the cleansing of the temple. Yeah, I mean they are they are vast topics in and of themselves. You're right. I do use them as as examples. The thing about John, and I think I mentioned this in part one of this interview, and that is that there are there are um, seven miracles that take place, mm -hmm. and they they're leading up successively, and they're representative essentially of 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 creation and the history of. Um, of, of God's um, revelation to man all the way through to the resurrection of Lazarus at the end okay um so the first one is the um the um turning of water into wine okay so um that miracle there is essentially an allegory of creation okay water and at the end you have the raising of Lazarus in his tomb um, he's buried in the earth and he's raised back to life by this dunamis, this great power that Christ has, this power of God coursing through him. OK. Now, how alchemy ties into all that is simply that Christ, if you like, is the consummate master who has complete mastery and control over the elements. Now. Um, magicians claim to have power over nature they can manipulate nature and that's essentially what magic is okay scientists operate in exactly the same way by manipulating nature we accept that uh, for what for what it is um, and of course with Christ you have the same process going on so it's always about alchemy it's always about transformation and using this material to prove a point okay and the point about Lazarus at the end there um, is simply that this is the first resurrection um, to take place. So he's telling everybody in Judea, this is a messianic age because the, the Messiah was prophesied to raise the dead. And here it is. Here's the sign. I'm using this power, this spirit to actually perform this so that you can see I am the Christ, I am the Messiah. And I have power over death. I have power over the whole of um, this organic matter, the flesh and the, the rocks and everything else, the earth, the air, the sea, everything in it. I can manipulate and I have that power. I am he. And that was the point of Lazarus. And that's an alchemical transformation because the man was dead. 
Okay. He was not only dead, he was very dead because he'd been in there three or four days. And even his sisters are saying, if you remember the narrative, it's going to be a bit smelly. Yeah. Right. They do. Um, and, and the worst of it is, of course, the other thing is Jesus actually waits for him to tie. So it, I, I don't know if you've ever been to Palestine, but Bethany is like half a day, a day's walk from Jerusalem. It's like easy to get there. And he just loiters around. And it, he's very distressed when he's told about Lazarus's death because they were good friends. And there's a there's a suggestion, perhaps, that even Lazarus may be St. John the Divine. Yeah. OK, I think there's some grounding for that but that's another matter um but he gets there to prove the point and to exercise this supreme alchemy this supreme magic this supreme science if you like over nature right nicodemus is aware of all of this now nicodemus of course he is a man of authority and of religion He'll be the equivalent of an archbishop in, in, in perhaps like, um, you know, in the Church of England or, or a cardinal if he was Roman Catholic. But he's a Jewish priest, he's a high priest, he's on the Sanhedrin. So it's very important. The Sanhedrin, of course, the 23 man council, I'm right, going back to 23, who stand as uh, the Supreme Court in Jerusalem. And he sneaks out under cover of darkness because that's a metaphor for the fact that he is in the dark night of the soul and he's a good man deep down and he can't work out how these miracles are happening if Jesus is not the Messiah and he doesn't believe he is because it's not part of his um, expectation that, um, th that he possibly could be and he sneaks out under cover of darkness and he is then told uh, and, it, and it's expressed in very alchemical terms that he needs to be born again, that he needs to be born of spirit. OK, and of course, he's physical. So Christ is using this alchemical terminology. He's saying to be born of water and spirit. This is what you really are. This is your true self. This is your immortal, mortal part of you. It's the spirit in you, not the not the evolved ape that we we are organically it's the spirit um, and there cannot be a stronger sort of alchemical inference than is contained in that particular chapter of gospel of john or i don't think anywhere else in the bible and of course it all comes back he refers to himself again like i say as the brazen serpent as the nehushtan okay um so it's an allegory that that Nicodemus would have understood as saying that, yeah, this this man here, Jesus of Nazareth, carpenter's son, he is a man. He's made out of the, the four elements, the same as the rest of us. But he also has the spirit of God in him. And that was the point being made. Yeah. The whole point of the Gospel of John. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And can you tell us about the cleansing of the temple? Oh, yeah, the cleansing of the temple. Yeah. Um, well... It's a political statement, obviously, uh, on one level. Um, on another, it's it's the purification, isn't it? It's the purification, the um, assaying, if you like, of the temple, um, again, in an alchemical way or symbolically. That's exactly what's happening in the same way that in order to get gold from a, a lump of rock that you find on the mountain, you have to break it down and melt it and clean it and it's the cleansing of that that's the that's the, the the main point there and actually tying in with Lazarus again Lazarus again um you'll note that in the gospel of John Christ doesn't actually ever touch the deceased yeah. so he remains clean and the process is pure the resurrection is pure in much the same way as the cleansing of the temple is a purification process yeah, and, and that's an ancient interpretation too, where the, you know some of the again the early Gnostics they said you know that this is why the the story was moved closer to the beginning of the narrative. It's it's in the end in the rest of the Gospels, right? Because you start with a cleansing, you know, the, you're chasing out because uh, Jesus is chasing out some of those animals and the money, right? You want to get out your your animal nature and the money changer that is within you, right? That that's pulling you yeah. down. Yeah. and that's what's happening at the miracle at Cana as well, because the very first one in the Gospel of John. The, the jars, um, the, the, these, these great jars, yeah, 
they 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 contain water, but they were used for, for the ritual purification of the groom at a wedding, yeah. and they contained exactly forty c, which in uh, in in their measurement back then was the exact amount of water you needed for a mikvah ritual cleaning pool where for instance the women would go after menstruation or childbirth as well to be cleansed so this whole thing about transformation and cleansing and and change it's it's in the whole gospel from beginning to end yeah. just the miracles get more dramatic and and nicodemus is just acting as the stooge or the fall guy for this story this narrative to be uh, played out he's us standing there going what do you mean we can't be born again and all that sort of stuff yeah so that's exactly what 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 he's doing he's been he's been the the straight man in the act well you know another connection a dopamine hit that that just popped into my head is you know hezekiah he did a, a kind of fake you know almost satanic cleansing of the temple by getting rid of the nushtin right of the brazen serpent uh and he's he's a king uh he's a religious leader uh but he does an improper cleansing of the temple and now we have a king a religious leader the true messiah doing the correct cleansing of the temple and also yeah. he's also the nushtan right he is just the brazen serpent coming back home <laughs> back why did i put that in my book that is brilliant thank yeah. you that's yeah. going in the second edition Okay, great. <laughs> okay, and uh, another massive question, but I, I'm going to link up some of our past shows on Kabbalah um, because, because it is important that we talk about this. But can you tell us a bit about how this, this ties into the Kabbalah and, and the diagram known as the Tree of Life? And, you know, we've been talking about these these opposites, right? And in Kabbalah, there, there's two pillars that, that, are, that are manifestations of the same divine force, but which are opposites. But there's actually a third pillar. Can, can you tell us a little bit about about this third pillar a little bit a little bit about how kabbalah pops up into the book and and ties into all these these recurring yeah. symbols uh, i mean the simple answer is i mean you've obviously you've got the 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 stave of of uh, of, of, of moses whereupon the, the knowledge turn is affixed um or the pole whichever uh, that it's affixed and that's representative i think of the middle path so remember it has god latent within it um and then you have the, the 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 winding serpent around it, which I suppose, and what I'm saying, suggesting is that it's it's a symbol really of the the paths one must follow through the sephirah in order to attain enlightenment. Okay, as you work your way through these worlds, there's a serpentine uh, tracing, but it's held upon this 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 pole of truth. Which, you know, I mean, if the people had not rebelled against the will of God, if they hadn't said we prefer slavery to to wandering around like this without food, just boring old manner to eat. You know, there's not even the McDonald's in sight. You know, if they weren't so selfish as that, then, then the Hushton wouldn't have been needed at all. And not only that, they wouldn't have had 40 years of wandering. So, you know, so again, like I think the Kabbalah really is, look, this is how things are. You've got the world and you have obviously the supreme deity at the top. And then you've got these different other worlds. And, and of course, they might be allegories of, of the here and now, or they could be representative of actual real worlds that we may have to traverse after this, where ours is somewhere on there. But either way, you can go straight to God if you know how to. There is that middle path, which is what Waite was always saying. The divine uni goes, take the middle path. It's shorter, it's quicker. Yeah, yeah. Um, okay, again, sort of maybe even touching on science. I, I find this quite interesting because you, you connect animism, which is a very ancient belief right something that, that goes yeah. back to the very the very early human ideas about religion and about how the world works and then you talk about mesmerism which is which is sort of in in between the ancient and the modern eras right you know yeah. it, it pops yeah. up in the in the 18th century yeah. it has elements of science it's considered a science and then we have the new sphere which is a more of a 20th century concept so what what are these and how are they connected to each other and, and sort of the ideas in your book Okay, and you want me to answer that in five minutes? <laughs> do, 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 do your best. <laughs> this is not going to happen. I know, um, I know. <laughs> no, I mean, 
you know what i mean the, the 18th century the century of lights the first modern century when science um really got going um it was on the 18th century that the great 19th century advances were made and it's a very different century the beginning of the 19th to the end okay now mesmerism and you go back a bit further actually to george stahl who started all of this off in fact even newton as well um before him had this idea of the life force um this sort of energy um that that life is i don't know about you but intuitively i feel that even though science rejects that somehow that there, there's some there's some truth in that isn't there the, the difference between what is it the difference between this is what they were asking between a rock and a living thing a living thing that will decay when it dies and grow before that point from small to old and then die and rot but a, a rock is more or less changeless or at least largely changeless it hasn't grown it's broken off from something and doesn't die but they're both physical things so what is it about life that differs and they came up with this idea essentially of energy flows or forces for newton electricity was spirit he didn't really understand electricity um and he he thought that was the substance of spirit but he was on the right lines but it's just that he mistook electricity for spirit as you would if you were around in the late 17th century um and you know that that's just how that is but again you could understand why you might have thought that because if you think about dunamis you know this power this this frightening force well electricity can be just that can't it yeah. and extremely lethal like um the poor old chap that um, um touched the ark of the covenant and died suddenly so newton would have been thinking along those lines it must be spirit um george Stahl came along and he said well look there is this difference between living things and non-living things and there's a difference between non-living things living things and dead things what is it and he came up with this idea of the life force um and then mesmer took it a stage further and said well actually we can heal with this force and we can we can use um, um the power of of magnets and we can use hypnosis and all sorts of other things to try and heal people because they were doctors you see all of these guys you know um the, 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 there's a lot of crossover philosophy theology and medicine but in science but they were doctors and that was how they understood it and they even influenced swedenborg and swedenborg went on to influence so many people today um so the idea that there is this force or energy um that is life where does it go um where does it come from exactly what it is can we manipulate it to heal this is what those particular guys were all about um Tyler de chardin is completely different because what he's really talking about is the evil well it's different in a sense i mentioned it earlier the evolution of people from um primordial soup and, and evolving through um, simian lions and everything to the point we are now, and then going even further to the point where our minds can actually operate on a disembodied way and influence the earth and create its own atmosphere or biosphere around the planet. And of course that's coming true in the internet, let alone actually in terms of our own evolution, although we've influenced that because we created the internet and artificial intelligence and things of that nature so yeah i mean tide art's really interesting but that's what he's about the evolution and we'll get to a point which is the newer sphere when we don't evolve anymore because we don't need to we're essentially um disembodied intelligences occupying like spirits if you like um a whole um realm or, or atmosphere biosphere around the earth and, okay. and you know, co comparing the, the new spirit to the internet, a, a lot of people don't know this, but Marshall McLuhan, the famous media theorist who sort of foresaw the internet uh, well before he died, was, was actually a devout Catholic with sort of 
mystical tendencies. And I think that was sort of an influence on his thought and him kind of seeing into the future a little bit. Um, well, Michael, we're, we're, we're coming to the end, even though, as, as I keep repeatedly saying, what, what I often say on the show, talking to many guests, you know, we could, we could keep going uh, uh, until we both drop dead. But I, I want to sort of tie it all up together, perhaps for people who didn't miss the, for people who missed the first show, for, for people who are kind of overwhelmed by these information dumps. So uh, I'll start with my friends, the ancient Gnostics. S something that, that sometimes confuses some people is uh, there's uh, this symbol of, of the Demiurge, the ruler of this world, which, by the way, is a, is a lion-headed snake, a snake again. And the ancient Gnostics made, made images of him on gemstones and carried them around. And, and people, you know, uh, sometimes ask me, well, why, why would they do that? Aren't, aren't they against the Demiurge? But there's this idea in, in the ancient world that if you had the name or the name and the image of an entity, you had control over it. So we have this, this a talisman. Talisman. Yeah. A talisman, it's a talisman. And we, we have this, this, this healing snake symbol that is protecting the people in the Moses story from, from literal snakes, right? But as we talked about in the first episode, the, the seraphim are uh, perhaps these fiery snakes might be different kinds of, of entities. This might all be a metaphor. Uh, uh, and we mentioned the martyrs as prevocating spirits. So can you, can you wrap this all up in a tiny bow for, for what this, this metaphor is? Uh, no. <laughs> but uh, but uh, but, I, but if you remember, I mean, the pharaohs had the uri on their on their headdresses, yeah, and it appears on other Egyptian motifs, and it's there, as you say, it's like a, I mean, anti venom itself um, is taken from a snake, isn't it, to cure snake bites, right? Yeah. Okay, so the cure is in 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 the cause, quite often. Um, and that's why serpents aren't all bad images. They, 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 they can also be, be good ones too. And, and suffering in and of itself ultimately can be a good thing if it leads to the right sort of change in people. If they're given long enough and, and they're able to learn from it, then it can. Um, indeed, not just for individuals, but for whole nations and cultures and um, indeed our entire race um so yeah the duality is essentially what you're asking me about and um you know it's a mystery isn't it and at the end of the day i'm afraid it's a mystery hey that that's a great answer because yeah i tried I, yeah no it is it, it's a fantastic answer because I, I think a lot of this at the end of the day is an, an invitation in the mystery and we want to enter into that mystery, be part of that mystery, and we may not always be able to solve it with our, our rational brains. Uh, well, we're in it whether we like it or not. Yes, that's right. We're actors in that mystery. Yeah. And um, I think it's a case of, you know, we've got the opportunity, we have the brains, um, let's, let's, let's engage with all of this and try and figure out what, what, what it is and how we, can, how we can improve everything, really. Um, and that, that's why you and I, do this it's why we talk about these things really yeah. and read around it and the people that listen to this too yeah exactly yeah. well i think that's the perfect place to to stop so we uh you can get the book wherever books are sold basically you know on amazon what have you but i'm throwing up on the screen uh rosecirclebooks.com slash published dash books i'm going to put the link in there that's uh, michael's publisher you can also check out his other books and the other excellent materials that uh rose circle is putting out uh, so definitely, definitely get your copy. And uh, let me see. I, I have my quick commercial for our Patreon. Uh, we can't do the show without your support. Patreon.com slash Gnostic. You can toss us a little as a buck per piece of media per month. We try not to run more than six pieces of media through the old Patreon. We try to do more. We haven't been doing more lately, but we, we are we are launching another show, Pop Gnosis, which is all about pop culture and uh, esoterica and Gnosticism. And it's, it's going to be a lot of fun. You can also put a cap on that. So if you just want to give us a buck, you can put a put a cap on it give us a buck a month paypal.me slash gnostic for one-time donations we understand if you can help us out financially tell people about the show send them uh your favorite episode which will probably be this one uh post it on your social media i hate telling people this but you know if you like subscribe and leave us a good review that that helps us get more listeners that that's unfortunately the way that the algorithmic game works <laughs> so uh, what is that is it a magazine john sorry what is that you're advertising is it a magazine or 
Oh, the the the, pay, the yeah. uh, Patreon. Oh, yeah. it's a it's a it's it's a uh, a service for um uh, for regular uh, micro donations. So it's uh it allows uh, people to uh, to send us money uh, basically uh, as a subscription as a donation every month. So Who it's for these lectures. Yeah, exactly. Because yeah, okay. right. it costs us uh, it costs us a little bit of money to to make them and uh, and a little bit of money for the time. But I I think it's uh you know it's uh, uh we're not exactly getting rich off this, folks. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. I don't know anybody. Uh, well, I guess. I guess there are people. You know, I'm getting rich off of esoterica, but they're they're generally not uh, people you want to listen to. But I'm sure there's some exceptions out there. <laughs> uh, Michael, I'll send you a dollar, John. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Michael. Thanks again. I, I have a feeling we, we will be speaking again, um, and I'm looking forward uh, to that. So uh, uh, take care and bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye.